What does the atheistic philosophy offer in a way of a moral standard? Often it is contended by the atheistic community that the God of the Bible and people who are trying to follow the Bible, they don't really even understand morals. And the atheistic community has a much better grasp on ethics and morals than a person who would believe in a God. Dan Barker said, there's no need for a belief in a God. You can live a really happy, joyful, wonderful, meaningful life without religious baggage. In his book, Godless, on page 161, he said, Believers in God do not have a corner on the morality market. I lay out a natural basis for morality, how to be good without God, and show how we non-believers actually have a better grasp on ethics than those who take the Bible seriously. You see, the contention there is that people who take the Bible seriously, they don't really even understand ethical, moral ideals, and the people who are non-believers have a better grasp of that. Sam Harris made a similar statement in his book, Letter to a Christian Nation. He said, anyone who believes that the Bible offers the best guidance we have on questions of morality has some very strange ideas about either guidance or morality. You see what Sam Harris and Dan Barker and the others are saying is that atheism gives us a perfectly legitimate foundation for ethics. And we can come to even better conclusions than people who believe in God because they are burdened with religious baggage. What would happen if a society were founded on the idea of unbelief, on the philosophy of atheism? the concept that there is no creator. That's a question that has been asked and answered in the past. In 1880, around that year, a man by the name of George Walzer decided he was going to found a town, and in that town he was only going to have people who didn't believe in God. Now the point of this social experiment was to show that you could get a productive, wholesome, good society without a belief in God. Now, soon after he founded this town, things started going downhill. A man by the name of Clark Braden came into liberal Missouri, and he reported on what he saw. And what he said was that all the hotels had become brothels, all the children were using curse words and bad language, and they were cussing out their parents, and they weren't obeying their parents, and the place had turned into a cesspool of immorality. And he put that in an article he wrote for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And in that article, when he wrote that, the people of Liberal did not take that sitting down. They weren't happy with his writing, and they proceeded to sue him for $25,000. Now, at the time, $25,000 was a lot of money. But he never even had to defend himself in court. What happened was that it became readily apparent that everything that he had said was true. And he was not committing libel or slander. He was just reporting the facts, and the case was thrown out of court, and the person who brought the case to court to sue Clark Braden had to pay all of the court cost. There you have a social experiment. What happens when a group of people get together and act on their atheism? What happens when you put the moral implications of atheism into practice? What are the moral implications of atheism? What we're going to see is that the moral implications of atheism are detrimental to any society. Let me read to you a statement by William Provine. He made this in 1998 in his Darwin Day Address on the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He said, naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Charles Darwin understood perfectly. No God's worth having exists. No life after death exists. No ultimate foundation for ethics exists. No ultimate meaning in life exists, and human free will is non-existent. You see, what William Provine was saying is that if there really is no God, there is no foundation upon which to build if asking the question, is this right or is this wrong? And he said Charles Darwin understood this perfectly. Is it true that Charles Darwin understood it perfectly? Yes. Yes, it is. In fact, Darwin made this statement. A man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. If there is no God, 
Charles Darwin said, then the best that I can see that a person can do would be to follow the impulses and instincts which seem the best to him. That's all atheism can give you as it relates to morality. You say, what would happen if a person did follow the instincts and impulses which seem the best to him? There was a person in the 1970s through the 90s who was recognized as one of the most horrendous, gruesome, heinous serial killers that anyone had ever heard about. His name was Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer killed 17 men and boys and did things to them that would literally make your stomach turn. He was sentenced to 900 years in prison. And while he was in prison, he was beaten to death. But before he was put into prison and sentenced for those 900 years and beaten to death, he was in an interview with Stone Phillips and his father in the 1990s. And they asked him, Jeffrey Dahmer, why in the world would you think that it would be all right to do this kind of thing that you did to other people, murdering them and beating them and doing the horrible things that you did to them. And I want you to hear what Jeffrey Dahmer said was the reason that he thought that this would be all right. He said, if a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. Now, when Dahmer's father asked him when he started feeling like he was accountable for the actions that he was committing, here's what Jeffrey Dahmer said. Well, thanks to you, Dad, for sending me that creation science material because I always believe the lie that evolution is truth. The theory of evolution is truth. That we all just came from the slime and when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So the whole theory cheapens life. If you were just to ask Jeffrey Dahmer, why did you think it was all right to kill 17 men and boys like you did? He gives you the answer. He says, if there's not a God, I saw no point in modifying my behavior. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Do I think that a person who is an atheist is going to go out and start committing crimes like Jeffrey Dahmer? No, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, I know very many atheists who are highly moral in many ways. They're not going to commit crimes like this. But what I am saying is the philosophy of atheism allows for this. As Dostoevsky wrote in his book, The Brothers Karamazov, if there is no God, then all things are permissible. Now, of course, the atheistic community would say, hold on just a second. People don't do bad things in the name of atheism. Richard Dawkins said, individual atheists may do evil things, but they don't do evil things in the name of atheism. Well, that just so happens that it's not true. People do bad things in the name of atheism. Let me introduce you to a gentleman who did something horrible in the name of atheism. His name is Pika Eric Avenin. And Pika Eric Avenin, when he was about 19 years old, he took a gun into his school and decided he was going to kill as many of his classmates as possible. He went there and killed seven of his classmates, killed the headmistress of the school, and then shot himself. Now, of course, when something like that happens, everyone wants to know why that happened. But in his case, you don't have to wonder why it happened. He told us exactly why he did what he did. Why would Pika Erica Venon go into his school and kill seven of his classmates and the headmistress and then shoot himself? Listen to his words that he posted on a website for everyone to read. Pika Erica Venon said, I, as a natural selector, will eliminate all who I see unfit, disgraces of human race, and failures of natural selection. You see what Pika Eric Avenen is saying as the reason for his actions. He says, I'm a natural selector. I am more fit than other people, and because I am more fit than others, that makes it all right for me to go in and kill people who are less fit than me. According to atheism, you cannot say that that is wrong. Now, the atheist objects and says, hold on just a second. What about the Crusades? What about the Salem witch trials or the Spanish Inquisition? Aren't those bad things that were done in the name of Christianity? Yes, yes, they were done by people who were saying they were doing them in the name of Christianity. But 
The difference here is that the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, the Salem witch hunts were not a fulfillment of the logical implications of Christianity. In fact, the atheistic community in their more candid moments recognizes that fact and admits that these were perversions of Christianity. Let me read to you a statement by David Mills in his book Atheist Universe. He said, The Crusades, the Inquisition, the witch burnings, the torture of infidels were all carried out in the name of the Christian God. While it's unfair to hold Christianity responsible for perversions of its teachings, it is nonetheless indisputable that historically more people have been slaughtered in the name of the Christian religion than for any reasons connected to atheism. Now that statement's not true. More people have not been slaughtered in the name of the Christian religion than anything connected to atheism. If you were to look at things like Stalin did and the millions of people he killed, etc. But I want you to focus on the statement that Mills makes here that Christianity cannot be held responsible for perversions of its teachings. Are the crusades, the witch hunts, the torture of infidels, are those perversions of the teachings of Jesus Christ? Yes, they are perversions of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Sam Harris recognized this. In his letter to a Christian nation, he said, You probably think the Inquisition was a perversion of the true spirit of Christianity. Perhaps it was. Yes, perhaps it was. That is never what Jesus wanted people to do. In fact, if you were to go to the Bible and try to come away with some type of justification for those types of criminal activities, you would never find justification for that. If you were to listen to what Jesus Christ and His inspired apostles wrote in the New Testament, you would see statements like this from 1 Peter chapter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Of course, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets you see that those were perversions of the teachings of Christ. You could never get from Jesus' teachings that it would be all right to do something like the Crusades or the Wish Hunts or the Spanish Inquisition. But what I am saying is the logical implications of atheism allow for the types of brutal criminal activity that Pika Erica Venon found himself committing and that Jeffrey Dahmer committed. I'm saying that that is the logical implication of this belief. But you don't have to take my word for it. Jeffrey Dahmer said that the idea of atheism devalues human life. He's not the only one who has said that. In fact, some of the highest ranking atheists in the world have admitted that fact. Let me read to you a statement by Peter Singer. In an article called The Sanctity of Life or Quality of Life, he wrote, if we compare a severely defective human infant with a non-human animal, a dog or pig for example, we'll often find the non-human to have superior capacities. Only the fact that the defective infant is a member of the species Homo sapiens leads it to be treated differently from the dog or pig. Species membership alone, however, is not morally relevant. You see what he's saying? We might have an infant that is human but it's got some type of disability. There's something that is not quite right with this human. And we might have another animal, like a dog or a pig, and we might assess the value of this dog or a pig and this human, and we might think that the dog or the pig could be more productive to human society. What are we going to say then? Should we value the human more than the dog or pig simply because it's human? Peter Singer says, well, if we're just higher animals and atheism is true and there's no God and we're not made in His image at all, then why would you value a human above a dog or a pig? Of course, Singer's not the only one who says that. James Rachels made this statement. In his book, The Moral Implications of Darwinism, he said, Human life will no longer be regarded with a kind of superstitious awe which it is accorded in traditional thought and the lives of non-humans will no longer be a matter of indifference. This means that human life will, in a sense, be devalued, while the value granted to non-human life will be increased. You see where this is going, don't you? If 
humans are just animals and there's no real moral difference between a human or a dog or a pig and you just assess their value based on how productive they are to society. What happens when you see that a dog or a pig might be more beneficial to society according to the atheistic thinking? What do you do then? Well, the atheist will tell you what they think you should be able to do in that case. Let's listen to what James Rachels said. Some unfortunate humans, perhaps because they've suffered brain damage, are not rational agents. What are we to say about them? The natural conclusion, according to the doctrine we're considering, would be that their status is that of mere animals. And perhaps we should go on to conclude that they may be used as non-human animals are used, per perhaps as laboratory subjects or as food. Now here's what I want you to understand. This is not a straw man that a creationist who believes in God, a New Testament theist, is making up. The logical implication of atheism is that if humans are nothing more than elevated animals, then if you see an animal that you think might be more productive to human society than a deformed or disabled human, then you could allow that animal to live and you could take that human and do to that human anything that you would do to a non-human animal, perhaps use it for experiments or for food. I didn't say that. That didn't come from me. That came from a man who is an atheist who is trying to flesh out the logical implications of atheism. And those logical implications of atheism are morally repugnant. It flies in the face of everything we know to be true. But only if God created humans in His image are they endowed with certain inalienable rights. Our forefathers had it right. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What truths are self-evident? That all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. But if they're not created by a Creator, and if that Creator does not endow them with His image, where do they get those rights? They don't. They don't get them at all. And that's why in 2006, the Distinguished Scientist of the Year Award in Texas was given to a man by the name of Dr. Pianca. And in his speech, he stood up and made the statement that humans are no better than bacteria. And Dr. Pianca contended that humans needed to be eliminated from the earth on a large scale because we are causing so much destruction. And if we are just animals and we're no better than bacteria and we're killing certain other animals and we're taking over the habitat of certain animals, he suggested that 90% of the world's population should be eliminated, the human population, to make room for all of these other animals. I want to read to you what some of the students who were listening to his speech had to say. One of the students said, Dr. Pianca's talk at the TAS meeting was mostly of the problems humans are causing as we rapidly proliferate around the globe. He's a radical thinker, that one. I mean, he's basically advocating for the death of all but 10% of the current population. And at the risk of sounding just as radical, I think he is right. Do you understand that? The distinguished scientist of the year in 2006 in Texas stands up and says humans are no better than bacteria and we need something, and he suggested something like airborne Ebola virus to kill 90% of the human population because we're getting in the way of all the other animals here on this earth. And the student who was listening to him said, you know, I think that's right. That is one of the moral implications of atheism. So if you were to ask, okay, how if there's no ethical foundation, no basis on which you make these decisions about what is right and what is wrong, how do you determine what is right and what is wrong if you're an atheist? They claim to have a better grasp on what's right and what's wrong than the person who believes in God. How do you determine that? One of the ways that they suggest to us that you determine what's right and what's wrong is that you weigh up suffering. You just try to decide where the most suffering is occurring and you try to eliminate the most suffering. Now, on the surface, that sounds pretty good. You weigh up the suffering, whoever's suffering the most, you try to eliminate that, whoever's suffering the least, you allow that to happen if you can't stop it, etc. 
But let's see just where this idea of weighing up suffering would take us. Richard Dawkins wrote this in his book, The God Delusion. A consequentialist or utilitarian is likely to approach the abortion question in a very different way, by trying to weigh up suffering. Does the embryo suffer? Presumably not, if it's aborted before it has a nervous system. And even if it is old enough to have a nervous system, it surely suffers less than, say, an adult cow in a slaughterhouse. You see how Dawkins proposes to go about making moral decisions. If you're asking the question, is it all right, is it moral, is it correct, or is it right and good to abort an unborn human baby? He says, well, the utilitarian would simply say, let's see if that unborn human baby suffers. And if it doesn't have a nervous system, well, it certainly can't suffer much. And even if it does have a nervous system, it probably suffers less than a cow in a slaughterhouse. So what? So if you could find a way to eliminate less than desirable individuals in the human population without them suffering, then he would say that that's a, a morally all right situation, that that's something that might could be morally permissible. You know, if you think through that, what if our society decided that five-year-old orphans were not good or beneficial for us? Could we eliminate them? They don't have any parents who would suffer emotionally because of their loss. They don't have any brothers or sisters, let's say. We'll say these are only child, five-year-old orphans. Could you eliminate them from your society? Well, according to this line of thinking, you would have to say yes if you could come up with a way where they would not suffer. So, if you told the police to find these five-year-old orphans and sneak up behind them and deliver a single lethal shot to the back of their heads with a pistol, them never suffering, never feeling any pain, would that be morally permissible? Well, I think you can see that that would be a terribly wrong idea. But according to this way of weighing up suffering, you couldn't have a problem with it. Richard Dawkins says, secular moralists are more likely to ask, never mind whether it is human, what does that even mean for a little cluster of cells? At what ages does a developing embryo of any species become capable of suffering? So what if something's capable of suffering? So what if we find a way to eliminate all of its suffering but still eliminate its life, would that make it a moral situation? Would it ever be right for our society to determine that if we could eliminate a certain group of people without them suffering, then that would be the correct moral thing to do? No. So what are we saying here? What we're saying is when the atheistic philosophy attempts to come up with criteria by which you could decide if something is moral or immoral, those criteria inevitably cannot maintain the pressure of true objective morality. How else do they try to reach for moral ideas? You know, sometimes it's the case that they look to the animal kingdom and they say, hey, if animals behave in this particular certain way and we're nothing more than animals, just higher on a level but no different from animals other than we are more intelligent or have different capacities or capabilities, if animals do something, then we could do that. If you were to look at statements like uh, Charles Darwin in his life and letters, he said there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. You see, he's saying you don't look at this particular organism and say this is different than humans, not on any kind of moral level, all you can say is that humans are elevated animals, but still animals. What's the implication of that? Let's listen to what James Rachel says about that. Animal behavior is routinely studied with an eye to acquiring information that can then be applied to humans. Psychologists who want to investigate maternal behavior, for example, might study the behavior of rhesus monkey mothers and infants assuming whatever is true of them will be true of humans, because after all, they are so much alike. Well, how can you determine what is good and right for a human mother to do? You look at rhesus monkeys, and if rhesus monkeys do a certain thing with their kids, or if rhesus monkeys behave in a certain way, then there's no possible way that you could say that humans doing that exact same thing would be doing something immoral, would be doing something wrong, because humans are just elevated monkeys. They're just on a little bit higher level, but not a different plane. They're not different from animals. They're just higher 
animals. Where would this lead? Well, Barbara Burke gives us some insight into exactly where this would lead. She said this, Among some animal species, infant killing appears to be a natural practice. Could it be natural for humans too? A trait inherited from our primate ancestors? Charles Darwin noted in The Descent of Man that infanticide has been, quote, probably the most important of all checks on population growth throughout most of human history. Barbara Burke says, we look at the animal world and they kill their babies. If we're nothing more than animals, what do humans sometimes do to check the population growth? Kill their babies. You might say we don't like that as a society. You might say we think that that is repugnant. You might say that we wish that that would not happen. But you know what you can't say according to atheism? You can't say it's morally wrong. You might try to say, well, that causes suffering. You might try to say, I don't like it based on this. But based on what? Provine said, and Charles Darwin admitted, that if there's no hope in God, then you can't follow anything other than what seems best to you. You hear what the implications of Barbara Burke's statement are? The implications are? She's saying that if we look at an animal and we see an animal that kills its babies, and if we're just animals, we kill our babies. You know what 10% of the diet of an adult Komodo dragon is? Baby Komodo dragons. They kill their babies. Is it permissible morally for us to kill ours? According to atheism, you couldn't say that it's wrong. You say, Kyle, that's disgusting. Where are you getting these ideas? I'm getting them straight from the atheistic community and their writings. I'm not making these up. I'm not pulling these out of thin air. Dr. Pianca is the one that said we need to eliminate 90% of the human population. Peter Singer is the one that said human species membership is not a morally dividing line. James Rachels is the one that said we could use humans for laboratory experiments or for food. Barbara Burke is the one that said if you're going to look at humans as nothing more than elevated animals and they kill their babies, so could humans. Let's see where else this idea would go. A man by the name of Randy Thornhill wrote on rape as it relates to evolution and atheism. And he said in a speech at Simon Fraser University that rape is evolutionary, biological, and natural. Our male ancestors became ancestors in part because they conditionally used rape. In the book that he penned with Craig T. Palmer, a natural history of rape, he said, evolutionary theory applies to rape as it does to other areas of human affairs on both logical and evidentiary grounds. There's no legitimate scientific reason not to apply evolutionary or ultimate hypothesis to rape. Isn't that disgusting? Isn't that horrible? that a person would say that rape is an evolutionary product that has been brought to us because our ancestors in the past conditionally used rape. Now, don't misunderstand what these guys are saying. What they're saying is we don't like it. We think it should be eliminated from society. We think that there is something that is less than beneficial going on with rape now. But if you were to say, is it objectively morally wrong? They cannot give you an answer to that question. You know why? Because atheism can't answer that question. In my debate with Dan Barker in 2009, I asked him the simple question, is it ever permissible morally to rape a person? And he said, well, it, it's a very uh, outlandish idea, but yes, it could be the case that some aliens could come down and they could demand that a person rape one girl to save all of humanity, and then it would be the morally right thing to do to rape her. And I said, could you rape two? And he said, it would be disgusting, it would be vile, I would probably kill myself after I did it, but yes, you could rape two. I said, could you rape 2,000? He said, yes, you could rape 2,000 to save all of humanity. I said, could you rape two million? He said, yes, you could rape two million people to save all of humanity. Do you see where that's going? What's happening there is if you're going to try to base your ethical foundation on atheism and try to say, well, 
you base it on weighing up suffering or you base it on how you can help the most people or you base it on how you can avoid the most harm, you see that you will never ever get a moral objective standard. You will always be wandering in the morass of immorality. Several years ago, a school killing that sparked such grief in our nation to elicit responses from all over the country occurred in Columbine. There in Columbine you had two individuals, Eric Harris and Dylan Kleibold, who decided that they were going to go into their school and they were going to eliminate as many of their students as possible, as many of their fellow students. They had elaborate plans to kill hundreds and hundreds of students and those elaborate plans fell through and they did end up killing several, but not nearly as many as they wanted to. When something like that occurs, the natural question to ask is why? What would be going on in a person's mind that they would think it would be morally permissible to kill other people like that? In Dylan Kleibold and Eric, Eric Harris's case, we don't have to ask that question because we have the answers. I want to read to you a statement that Eric Harris made on a website. He said, I would love to see all of you blanks die. NBK. I love it. Sometime in April, me and V will get revenge and we will kick natural selection up a few notches. He said, I would sooner die than betray my own thoughts, but before I leave this worthless place, I will kill whoever I deem unfit for anything at all, especially life. You see what Eric Harris was saying? He was saying that if I am nothing more than an evolved animal and I want to eliminate other evolved animals, there's nothing wrong with that and I am helping the process of natural selection. It is not a coincidence that on the day that he killed his fellow students, he wore a shirt that said natural selection. What is objectively morally wrong with what Eric Harris did? Do you know that according to atheism, try as you might, as Sam Harris has tried to put in the moral landscape that there is objective morality based on the philosophy of atheism and godlessness, you can't get it. There's no possible way that you can say this is objectively morally right and this is objectively morally wrong. Who is it that said you could look to animal behavior and see what they're doing and you could correspond that behavior to humans, the atheist? Who is it that said we could eliminate 90% of the human population and that would be morally permissible? The atheist? Who is it that said rape is evolutionary and biological and you can't separate it from what our ancestors did to get us here? The atheist? Who is it that said that you might could take a human and treat that human as laboratory experiment or as food? The atheist? Why? because William Provine nailed it when he said, if you give up the belief in a God, there is no ethical foundation upon which you can base a moral right and wrong. It is the case, and it's indisputable, that if there is no God, all things are permissible. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.